we're really pleased to introduce you to Vizcaya's new curator, Elena Gomez de Cordoba. Elena joined us in February of this year and mobilized swiftly to commission Wish Towers. Elena comes from the Museo de Arte de Ponce in Puerto Rico via the Courtauld in London and Providence College in Rhode Island. Before joining Vizcaya, she coordinated and curated numerous exhibitions in Ponce, such as Vic Victorian art, provenance, the lost history, and small treasures from the Frick collection. Elena's collaborated with various museums and collections in the United States and brings in-depth professional experience managing collections in a tropical climate, which is so important here. Elena, we're thrilled to have you on our team and we're thrilled to learn more about Wish Towers this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Wendy, for your kind words and for reminding us all of the origins of CAP. Um, I will begin by expressing how incredibly exciting it is to be at Vizcaya and to be hosting a new CAP reception. So thank you everyone for coming out this morning and joining us to celebrate another year of Vizcaya's contemporary arts program and our artist, Jaime and Javier Suarez de Rocal. Uh, this year exhibit coincides with Vizcaya's 100th anniversary of its gardens. As many of you may know, the main house was built between 1914 and 1916, but it took a few more years to complete the gardens. Since their completion in 1922, Vizcaya's gardens have provided beauty, generated wonder, and still the sense of tranquility and, uh, to guests and visitors. This is the result of its design, which considers symmetry, proportion, and harmony, but also its natural treasures. It is in this intersection of art and nature that inspire our, new, our newest contemporary art commission, Wish Towers, by Puerto Rican artist Jaime and Javier Suarez de Rocal. But before jumping into conversation about their work, I'd like to thank everyone that made this project possible. Our sponsors and generous donors, who, will, uh, who Wendy has already mentioned, and our partners uh, so graciously before, and, um, but also the Vizcaya team. We often hear in the museum that it takes a village, and I can now vouch for that. So I'd like to thank the CAP team for their constant support throughout the planning and execution of this project, my colleagues in the Art and Artifacts Stewardship from their for their guidance and for always willing to get their hands dirty, and the horticulture team for their beautiful arrangements that we'll see um, today. Uh, but also a special shout out to our maintenance crew, uh, because each exhibition brings a particular set of challenges. And without the support of Victor's team, Oscar, Peluso, Eddie, Jorge, Enrique, I think they're here today, uh, this installation could have been a lot more difficult. <laughs> uh, so turning our attention to the artists now, I'll make a brief introduction. Artists Jaime, Jaime and Javier Suarez de Rocal were born in Columbus, Ohio, but their roots and life's work are tied to Puerto Rico, the Caribbean island whose vast beauty and natural landscape fuels their artistic practice. They studied at the uni University of Puerto Rico and obtained their MFA degrees in artistic production with a focus in public art from the Universidad Politecnica de Valencia in Spain. Their passion for the arts and the ocean guides their interest in the environmental forms of expression. And their artistic practice develops concepts and strategies to respect and protect the environment. Through their work, they bring awareness to ecological concerns define cultural identity, inspire a feeling of belonging, and encourage responsibility for the natural world around us. They have exhibited around the world, including the United States, Mexico, China, United Kingdom, and Switzerland, and their work can be found in private collections and cultural institutions. Today, they're here to speak about their contribution to Vizcaya's contemporary arts program with Wish Towers, an installation that honors Vizcaya's commitment to environmental sustainability. So let's get this conversation started. Um, thank you all again for being here today and hopefully it won't be too sunny. Um, Jaime, Javier, you've embraced site specificity and have created a sculpture that is seamlessly sipped into the landscape of our, of our gardens. Um, I know we were starting with a conversation, so I don't know if you have had the opportunity to walk to our gardens to see the sculpture, but if you haven't, uh, I do encourage you to do so after our talk and continue the conversation there. Um, so perhaps we can open this conversation with your first impressions um, when you visited Vizcaya and our, our, our gardens. And um, perhaps talk a little bit about also your practice because you've just mentioned a few minutes ago speaking to um, our director, Joel, about how, um, how you usually create site-specific 
installations in really remote places, mm. which is really the opposite of what we have here at Vizcaya with the amount of, of people that visit and come through our doors on a daily basis. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. <laughs> we're really happy here to, to see everyone. Hopefully, I can meet each one of you, you know, but it's, uh, that'll be a challenge, too. <laughs> uh, I'm Javier. And, and My name is Jaime. Yeah. And they're twins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we work together. Uh, it's also a challenge, no, to work with your twin brother. Uh, it seems it's not, but no, it's a, it's always a a a discussion, no, uh, between his ideas and my ideas. Uh, but uh, mostly it's uh, uh, with the materials and with a uh, place that we're uh, interacting, no. And uh, when we came uh, the first time here to Vizcaya to see this uh, amazing building, we were overwhelmed with this uh, work. No, uh, you can see this uh, coral rock. This coral rock uh, uh, has uh, these uh, fossils. fossils. No, of uh, it, it feels like uh, you have a glimpse into the past. No, into a life that used to be in this planet, no? and uh, but it also talks about the new challenges uh, we have now. No, it reminds us of what's happening right now uh, in our oceans. Uh, so we we decided to uh, address. address this issue with our intervention uh, in this museum. No, uh, but at the same time, uh, we wanted to blend. We knew that our intervention had to blend in with the history and the context of the of the gardens and the buildings, and we were thinking uh, before before designing these ideas. Let's try to think like someone from 1920s. You know, what would they like to have in this building? Because it's a way of respecting al also the audience that visit the museum and wants to uh, feel that sense of history. But, you know, contemporary art has to also clash against history and bring something uh, new to the discussion of our images. So we thought that it was better to to contrast with an uh, ideology, a different ideology that maybe perhaps uh, James Deering had in, in his time, uh, although he was also into conservation, but uh, we wanted to do an artwork that proposes another form of conservation, uh, the one that is contemporary, and it's the idea of borrowing resources, not for a for construction for permanent constructions, but it's only borrowing from nature, and then everything has to go back to its previous uh, place, and so help to regrow uh, the coral reefs or the uh, mangroves in the area. So what uh, you guys are invited to see is just a work in progress. It's something uh, our work is always in progress. We. Uh, think about uh, our work as uh, eternally uh, in, in transformation no? or uh, well, mutation okay. into rematerialization. No? So uh, what you're seeing, uh, what, what you're invited to see today is going to be here for six months and eventually it'll come back to uh, our island in Puerto Rico where we live and the idea is to uh, plant it uh, or to install it underwater and hopefully in the future create a new uh, coral ecosystem, no? ecosystem yeah. so for now uh, we're fantasizing uh, with this uh, installation that was inspired is site specific it was inspired by this building it started uh, dreaming about uh, something that would uh, express the uh, uh, the place that uh, we're interacting no this place that we're right now um, and but eventually this will keep transforming growing uh, there're going to be plants that 
are gonna be planted in this uh, museum that we're gonna hopefully be able to herminate on top of this uh, installation or sculpture. Yep, you've said so, so many said things. Said so many different, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so much <laughs> to unpack here. <laughs> um, they've, they've been speaking a little bit about their practice, uh, about the concept of borrowing. Um, mm. So whenever they take something from the land, they bring it back, but also with the idea of, of improving or uh, helping the ecosystem in, in any way that they can. But let's backtrack a little bit. Um, mm. You've talked about the coral limestone that we see at Vizcaya, so that is the, primarily, the primary material that inspire their work. What we're going to see out there today, it's these pieces of corals that they've recollected throughout the shores mm. and different areas of Puerto Rico. And just to be clear, this is not uh, live coral. It's corals that have been uh, dead for m many, many years, uh, mm -hmm. some bleach, and they've found them. So um, they're trying to give them um, a second life, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think your work is a lot about second chances, and we, we can talk mm -hmm. about that a little later. Um, but talking about the, the material itself, um, as you'll see that Vizcaya has a lot of coral limestone. Much of it was quarried here locally, but was also brought in from Cuba. So there's also that connection with, mm -hmm. with Caribbean. And, um, and you, you were impressed by the amount of coral that is embedded in the architectural elements in our gardens, but also the different shapes found in the gardens. And at the beginning of my introduction, I talked a little bit about the symmetry and balance and um, the classical design of the gardens, and that and you've incorporated that in a way into your sculpture to make it you know blend in with with the landscape rather than clash with it mm -hmm. even yeah. if conceptually it does do so um and that is also something that is very important to your practice uh, from what we've been speaking the the idea of interbeing in nature and work with the environment rather than disrupt it mm -hmm. um yeah. so let's talk a little bit more about the materials because a few months ago when we you know throughout the the development of the project, you talk about how um, materials speak to you and come to you in many different ways. So you've collected these corals, and then what do you do in the studio with them? Well, we bring them to our studio, and we have a, uh, a lathe for carving wood, really, not corals. But uh, mm -hmm. we're also challenging the lathe with this uh, resource because it's salty, you know, and it's uh, uh, metal and machine, uh, uh, machinery, you know, so we have to turn these corals, but we also have to uh, clean the lace constantly because, you know, it can uh, get stuck. It's dangerous too, the coral uh, is brittle sometimes, so it explodes in the studio. I almost lost my fingers, my brother too, <laughs> you know, in this project. Uh, but it's a uh, uh, you, you start learning how to manage this resource mm -hmm. and uh, how to let the, each coral, uh, its organic form, dictate the artificial form that we're discovering in, in, the, in the resource. Um, when uh, it's, it, it all starts uh, by walking around uh, the island and uh, visiting different places and understanding uh, why this material is arriving to our shore. No? We've been diving and fishing our whole life, so this material, we've been familiarized uh, with it since we were young. But now we're seeing, maybe uh, now that I'm aware of uh, what's uh, the situation that we're facing. I'm, I'm starting to see more of it, maybe, I don't know, or maybe it was there uh, since ever, you know? But uh, we, we decided to work with this material because uh, 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 our ecosystems are under threat. In the Caribbean, you, we have this uh, coral bleaching all over, uh, but it's actually happening all over the planet, you know? has to do with acidification of the oceans. It has to do with some bacteria that are, new bacteria that are arriving, no? And impacting some of the corals. Uh, but mostly it has to do with our human impact into the landscape, no? Uh, coastal de it has development. To, it has to do with coastal development. It has to do with agriculture, with, with a 
amount of nutrients that are uh, overflowing to the rivers and uh, eroding uh, our coast uh, and our rivers uh, also because of the uh, deforestation, no? So uh, this material is a real issue that we're facing and hopefully working with it, we can reflect upon uh, maybe a new way of thinking about uh, how to create or, or to imagine uh, new ideas, no? But uh, with sensibility towards uh, the land or the landscape, no? Or, the, or nature or surroundings, no? Yeah, so. uh, and mm -hmm. coral is the prominent uh, material in the sculpture, but it's not all there, there is mm -hmm. to it, right? Um, you've, in, in, in your work, you work with nature and um, this intersection between art and nature here at Vizcaya, you found it with the mangroves mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in our coastal shores. Um, and it will, I think you can speak more to it about this, but besides having the, the, the stalagmites of corals or these, these towers of corals, one of them carries um, mangrove mm -hmm. uh, propagals. Yeah, uh, you know, we knew that we wanted to do a project that would help our buffer zone in Puerto Rico, you know, that it's uh, mostly coral. But we also wanted to leave something here, you know, because it's a site-specific uh, uh, project, you know, what Puerto Rico can bring to Vizcaya and what can Vizcaya help for mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. So uh, these sculptures are herminating pro uh, mangrove propagals. And so the audience has to activate a hand rotary pump manually, uh, pump water, and, and help the propagals, water the propagals, mm -hmm. the mangroves propagals to, to herminate. Eventually, at the end of the installation, uh, six months from now, these propagals will be little trees that we can plant in, in the coast. And it's symbolic, you know, uh, sculpture is not gonna resolve this uh, ecological problems that we're having globally. Mm -hmm. But it's a way of uh, being aware of the problem and taking action. And the hand rotary pump, it's a symbol of this collective effort that we need, you know, that. Uh, uh, anyone can help out with a little bit of water. The good thing about the mangrove propagals is that you can water them excessively and it's better for them. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. with all these visitors the museum has, uh, maybe you will have beautiful mangroves to plant. <laughs> so it's a little bit of an experiment too. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah. See, we'll see what happens. But you've um, it's not just one propagal that you've chosen, you've chosen four of them, and you said mm -hmm. that they were all in different stages of growth. Um, and it is also, it's an experiment to see which one also may survive, hopefully all of them, but um, mm -hmm. survival of the fittest. Yeah, I yeah. Also, there's uh, other species in, in the sculptures, mm -hmm. the Tilancias. And why did we decide the Tilancias? Uh, the Tilancias are a metaphor for us of uh, resilience. They're plants that don't need, it's the opposite of the, the propagals. They don't really need much of our care. Uh, they survive with no uh, water, no water or land uh, or earth, you know. Mm -hmm. So they're up there, epiphyte, uh, it's an epiphyte plant. So they're up on the top of, the, of some of the sculptures that were also collected here mm -hmm. at the site and at Vizcaya. Yeah. Um, and They're endemic uh, also and native. And it speaks to your process because you came in with a, with a notion of what you wanted to accomplish, but the project evolved during the installation. Oh, yeah. And you added all these other plans. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were amazed uh, when we got here uh, of it, uh, this beautiful landscaping and, and the challenge it takes for the staff to maintain it, to keep it this way, no? And it's a place where you, you get uh, to see exotic plants uh, in a landscape that was uh, altered no? or transformed by the human intervention. 
But it's interesting too to see how these trees that are native to this place are somehow reclaiming uh, their their place into into the, garden. into the gardens, no? And you can see them on top of other trees, no? These epiphy plants, uh, uh, like tilansias and or uh, coupe trees or, or orchids, some orchids that are uh, only from here, from uh, Florida. Uh, but uh, and, and also uh, the struggle or the negotiation that uh, the landscaping uh, or landscapers uh, need to uh, to do with the uh, with the mangroves, no? Uh, they're try trying to come back to this uh, landscape that they used to own, no? So. Uh, we wanted to work with these plants because uh, that was the first uh, impression, one of the first impressions that we had. So it's basically that. Uh, what's the relation with this coral and with the land or with these plants, no? The plants that are also in the litoral, in the... The shores. The shores. Mm -hmm. uh, and protect us also from uh, surges, uh, ocean surges and uh, hurricanes. Uh, but you know, uh, humans also love the the uh, those uh, territories that the mangroves need. That those are for us, the humans. That's a favorite place, no? Prime real estate. Coast of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, prime real estate, no? So that's why they're they're under threat. But it's amazing to see that. But they're also very resilient. They're very resilient plants. They're uh, landscape. Uh, the landscaping uh, team here has to constantly be uh, fighting, no, or not fighting, you know, just trying to maintain uh, the the garden from those uh, plants that are reclaiming it. And uh, well, what, what we wanted to to create is a space where they can also uh, strive, strive, or, or, strive yeah. or start to yeah. to create life. Your piece is also. Um, it correlates to Vizcaya in many other different ways. Um, mm. Perhaps you want to explain why you've chosen four towers or outer towers mm. and both the number of towers and the height of them have a connection to Vizcaya. Yeah, so the, the, the first time we came here, we, you know, you become almost like a detective. <laughs> You're walking around and, you know, uh, discovering places, uh, evidence of some intentions from the past uh, or uses that the building used to have before it was a museum. And we noticed that there's a, there's a, a compass here. Mm -hmm. uh, right on the right? I believe it's it? covered by oh. the rug, unfortunately. Okay, it's, <laughs> it's covered by the, the rug, but you know, it We're may... The, I think it's this right yeah, here. But it's a <laughs> compass that James Deering uh, placed there, and it's, uh, you know, we, we also wanted to make this sculpture a compass. Mm -hmm. So each tower, you know, the center one, it's uh, the site-specific center place where we're placing the sculpture. But the four of them are the cardinal points. So they're aligned with the north, the south, the east, the west. But also, it's a wind rose. So the tallest tower makes reference to the strongest wind. The, the smallest tower makes reference to the uh, small, uh, uh, the lightest winds mm -hmm. during the year. So we were deciding this uh, artwork that somehow makes you aware of the the climate and the specificity uh, specificities of the place and the geological location of the place. But we're also designing, no? Because um, it also needs to to look symmetrical. For us, it was very important to respect uh, this uh, vision that James Deering had about this garden being uh, uh, very symmetrical, no? Uh, and, and also his uh, almost like, I would say, almost like obsession with the verticality, no? With the, obelisk and the towers and the vertical sculptures. So all, all those uh, impressions, they were, you know, uh, 
gathered as information to design and, and create. Why, why, why not you know, make an artwork that uh, can live with its surroundings? <laughs> yes, it alludes to um, the concept of navigation, which mm -hmm. was yeah. very important uh, at Vizcaya at the time. Deering had multiple boats, and he went out fishing mm -hmm. and, and had 10-day cruises to the Keys. Um, yeah. And he had a, a windrose as well. And inside the house, you know, you, you see it, uh, like another compass and um, another um, tool to, to measure the, the wind speed. So it's it's referencing mm -hmm. um, the past, but it's also references geographical specificities. To, yeah, to also, time. also to the propagos, mm -hmm. uh, to the mangrove. No, mm -hmm. the sea travels, navigates, uh, and needs constant uh, watering. Like mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. corals are also reclaiming but the water all the time, and they're in the pool. So, mm -hmm. but also uh, the flower of the mangrove looks like a compass. It's a very beautiful flower. I don't mm -hmm. know if you notice it, but. You can see it in It the has also four <laughs> petals <laughs> mm -hmm. and, right. and in the center where it germinates. And that also gave us the idea. Actually, the flower of the mangrove is called the wind rose. Mm -hmm. So we found that relation with, the, with Vizcaya, with the mangrove, with the sculpture, with the compass. Uh, you know, everything got... Uh, and, it's, and it's funny because at the same time, you know, uh, James Deering had a, almost like a love and hate relationship with the mangroves, right? Like, he, he loved the mangroves. Uh, the mangroves provide him with channels for, for his boat, boating experience. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there was a belief of the time that the mangroves were hosting dengue fever and, and malaria and all this disease that was a uh, menace for him. So uh, he, he was manicuring the mangrove constantly, right? <laughs> There's definitely a lot of uh, man-made... Um, Maybe it's my interpretation, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but there's guess, a lot of me yeah. metaphorically and, and, and physical relationship to, to the mangroves and to the site, mm -hmm. that's for sure. We, we took a little bit of liberty uh, when we were designing the heights of the, the sculptures, because uh, we were determining uh, the height uh, because of the wind speed, no? But for the south uh, southern winds, we decided to mm, elevate it a little bit more. No? Uh, it works, visually it works better. But we were contemplating, is it necessary uh, to uh, keep it as uh, exact? exact? Mm -hmm. uh, and we decided, no, nah, let's give it a little, a little right. bit uh, taller, that tower. And it's curious, because mm -hmm. some, for some reason, uh, those winds, uh, when we were installing, uh, they picked up. They picked up. Into and they brought us a hurricane. No? <laughs> Right during so the installation, so we the were day of the inauguration uh, uh, actually was the, um, the day the, uh, the right. hurricane was arriving, uh, <laughs> uh, the Patricia yeah. hurricane. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, Nicole, uh, Nicole mm -hmm. uh, hurricane. So, so we, yeah, we've had a lot of challenges. <laughs> you've you've in had the a lot process. of challenges during the installation, <laughs> and that it's a great. I have a great follow-up question to that. Um, <laughs> so the sculpture does seem to effortlessly uh, float on the water. Um, but believe me when I say that it, there was nothing effortless about this installation. Mm -hmm. And you probably, you chose probably the, one of the hardest sites to work in at Vizcaya because the reflective pool where this is installed is it's wet and it's very deep, which we didn't know at the time when we yeah. started the project. So. There were a lot of trial and errors during the installation and evolving ideas that we've spoken about. Uh, perhaps you want to elaborate on some of the challenges at working at a, a historic site like this guy. Yeah. yeah, location is location. You know, it's really important. <laughs> and you know, the idea uh, when when we saw the the main pool, the main garden, and the pool of the main garden, we automatically fell in love with the site. 
more my brother than me, you know, but he was like, <laughs> it has to go there, it has to go there. And I was like, okay, well, you know, we're gonna have to deal with it, the depth that probably is gonna be like two feet maximum. And I was, <laughs> yeah, of course. Our other pools are just yeah, 24 yeah. inches. And, and maybe we'll lose uh, a couple of, uh, uh, visually lose uh, a, a couple, couple of, of uh, coral uh, <laughs> rocks because they're gonna be underwater. But you know, there's no problem. But then when we started making measurements, uh, it was nobody really knew how deep was it, and uh, but they knew it had at least five feet, and nobody knew what was inside the pool either. If it was a flat, it was stones, it was a <laughs> uh, uh, babote, uh, muck, yeah. muck. Mm -hmm. and you know we were in Puerto Rico making our designs and work and and working with the coral, so it was impossible for us to do the experiments, and the only reference we had of that pool empty, because we knew we were not gonna uh, empty the pool. There's fishes and mm -hmm. different uh, animals, animals living there, there mm -hmm. turtles and everything. So we didn't wanna uh, disturb, their disturb yeah. the water. So the only reference we had of that pool was a 1914 no, yeah, picture. picture that James Deering took <laughs> of the construction of the pool. And we had to get in that pool, me and my brother. It, it's murky water that you can't see, not even your hand. Uh, Good thing you're divers. Yeah. So <laughs> luckily mystery. we're divers, you know. The mystery <laughs> is solved. The mystery is solved and there's but we nothing. we had to touch <laughs> the whole bottom of the pool for almost five days, you know, to <laughs> understand how to make a scaffold to. It's because you came with a, the idea of hmm. having just this independent towers and mm -hmm. when you went into the water um, you realized that that was not going to work yeah. so you talked about having um, ne to negotiate the materials <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, it's and always. it ended up being as you said like mm -hmm. a, a scaffolding structure yeah, some yeah. structure that is holding up all these corals above water yeah yeah you don't you don't get to see it because uh, it's underwater and we also wanted that we were we, we wanted to work with that pool because the water is so murky that it creates a reflection. And reflection and symmetry is important, but it also has a sense of duplicating the sculpture, making it even look taller mm -hmm. when you discover the reflection. So, I'm talking you know, about negotiating <laughs> materials, because I thought it was, you know, it's part of your practice of, of how, how you work. Um, you know, the first thing they did when they came for the site visit was we show them every single trash can we have at Vizcaya to see if they could like <laughs> recycle something. And um, little did we know that we are doing a great job recycling <laughs> at Vizcaya because there was nothing that we could provide them with uh, to, to be able to, to create the, the structure that you wanted. So we ended up having to purchase some materials, yeah. which is not your usual uh, way of Every, every project has its uh, own agency and, and, and form of addressing it. So uh, it just working with the, the so, uh, looking for solutions in every challenge that mm -hmm. you face. Mm -hmm. And not quitting ever, you know, keep doing, go forward, go forward, go forward. And the, the piece is still going to bring challenges. Because sometimes the hand rotary pump gets stuck, and you know you have to maintain it, change parts, you know. But it's part of there, there's a there's a basic idea that a public art is something you build and you live, you know, and it's eternal, and you don't have to uh, maintain it, you know, and that's well done. But the way me and my brother work. Uh, has to reflect on, on, on life, on, on living, you know, and every living thing, you know, needs maintenance or uh, things break and decay and decay and transform and also you have to, uh, you know, maintain it. We have to cut our hairs every time, <laughs> clip our nails every time. Why not sculptures? Why, why, why can't they also have that... Uh, uh, participation in our uh, in our life, so they're gonna bring more challenges in the future until the six months uh, 
No, and then after after that, uh, when we when we install it underwater to start creating a a new ecosystem, underwater ecosystem, that's gonna be a challenge that my brother and I will have to be revisiting for the rest of my life to see what's happening there, to take care, to maintain. So it's also a compromise uh, uh, we're making with this uh, material that uh, as well as the mango reflecting upon uh, our purpose uh, and our inter interaction in, in the landscape. Well, I have one closing question because I know it's getting a little hot, <laughs> but um, it may be a burning question for many. Um, what does the title Wish Towers mean to you? Yeah, well, you know, we're wishing a lot of things. <laughs> and recently, you know, and from, from my island in Puerto Rico, we have a lot of things to wish, but, you know, holds the future. Uh, but also, it's a simple metaphor or a simple reference. Uh, in, in the Caribbean, yeah, I don't know if you... Uh, seen these little sculptures that people do with corals. They put, they stack up uh, top of each uh, coral, another one, and they're balanced. And it's a way of wishing. Uh, you, you make a, a wish with, with every rock, a rock or every coral that you place one on top of the other. Mostly the wishes is, please, I want to come back here, you know, because it's <laughs> a beautiful place to rest. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this sculpture is obviously wishing a way of living sustainable, uh, of uh, inhabiting this planet with respect for the environment and awareness of, of this uh, difficult challenge we're going to have to face in the future. But it's also a reference, I, uh, I would say, to Miami, no? With these towers and this dream that many people come here dreaming, no? to build and construct and elevate uh, our our dreams no so so yeah that's i guess that's the the title the title came out uh, elena had a beautiful suggestion for the towers uh, for the uh, for the wish towers and we said and in the perfect. Th yeah in the in the three of us talking about the concept and the <laughs> and, and the design we said, like, hey, you know, maybe this is the, the title. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and I think And I won't take well. all that credit. It was also <laughs> in discussions with colleagues uh, here okay. at Vizcaya. Mm -hmm. But it, it is a beautiful title and a beautiful message that you want to um, share with the world. So I do like to thank you for your kind spirit, <laughs> your hard work, and your beautiful creation that you've made here for us. Um, and now I invite everyone to go see the sculpture. Uh, join us in the in com more conversations in the gardens and have uh, some refreshments there for you. So thank you for coming out today, this morning. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.